Uh, we're only a, a small number of people, so uh, we can make this really quite interactive. Uh, I, I want to give you some kind of uh, perspective. I had uh, a pretty bad education, um, and weirdly, I have uh, one O level, uh, two really bad A levels, and then I have a uh, first class honors degree, a master's degree, a PhD, a DSC, and then they gave me seven doctorates for free, which is kind of weird. And all I did was get out of bed every day and work hard and have fun. Uh, one of my hobbies uh, is tackling really difficult problems, uh, just because it, it's kind of fun. And I've been building stuff and solving problems all my life. And it's always seemed to be I've got the really bad problems that other people didn't want. And it's always stretched my engineering capability, thinking, mathematical capability, uh, right to the limit a lot of the time. So I'm going to take you on a, a bit of a journey and uh, take you down an industrial problem uh, that, was, that was very real, is very real, and it's one that you are likely to face. And I'm going to sort of give you some hints. So here's a sort of uh, perspective. Uh, you go to school, you go to college, you go to university, you're absolutely spoilt rotten by a series of subjects that you are taught in a confined space where you are given problems that have solutions that can actually be marked by the professor or the lecturer. And all the problems you get are nice, well-behaved, and linear. There's nothing bad about them. It, it's all turn the handle, stuff happens, you get the answer, everybody feels pleased. Well, it turns out when you get into industry, you find the first problem you get, none of that is true. It's not easy, it's not well behaved, it's not linear, and it's not lim limited, and you find yourself in the driving seat and everybody's looking at you. So the first one that I got was in my second year of my first degree, which was a five-year engineering degree, and I polled into a research lab run by British Telecom, it was the GPO then, and a transatlantic cable, TAT7, which was the last analog cable, coaxial cable across the Atlantic, was going into oscillation. And so they had to power it down and power it back up, and it would stay up for a while, then it would go into oscillation, and no one could figure out why this was happening. And I was given the problem almost as a joke, you know, second year student, what the heck could he do? So I just bowled into this thing and started playing. And I discovered that um, when you took the amplifiers and you loaded them a little bit, things happened to their characteristics, not very much, but a little bit. There were over 200 of them concatenated. And what happened was the concatenation of a small effect over the length of this system, put it into an oscillatory mode, and I came up with a solution that all they had to do was operate it at a slightly lower level uh, of signal. I was not popular. I mean, I was really unpopular because I, I came out with a little theory that was uh, polynomial, and the mathematicians uh, sort of balked at it. Nobody believed me, and then AT&T discovered the same thing, and um, I was sort of quickly pushed out the door. So that was my first experience. So what I can tell you is the universe is not naturally a well-behaved place. It is inherently nonlinear, chaotic, and it does surprising things. So what I suspect is that that little white blob is where you are now and where I have been in my education, that's where we're educated. Where our engineering problems are, are out here in a space that we don't understand. And that's the space I always seem to find myself in. And it's kind of fun, but difficult. So if we look at a, a problem, and, and we have either an analog or a digital problem of this nature, we can crack this one because of the limited number of feedback loops. So if we, you know, second order, third order, fourth order, 
By the time we get to fifth order, we're right on the edge of what can be done. And to crack a fifth order polynomial, we have to do things like make all the variables the same, <laughs> make them have similar characteristics, and we get a very narrow view. Order six, we're dead. Okay, now what we're dealing with, unfortunately, is systems like this, and this is what you were doing in class, with hundreds of feedback loops that are both forward and backward loops. And if somebody tells you that we understand how this stuff works, they're lying, because we have not got a blind clue. It works, but there's a deal of prayer goes into them when you switch them on, and no one understands how a 747 operates, or anything else. So we, we're, we're a little bit uh, at a, a risky edge, and, and this is a real diagram produced by PA Consulting for General Petraeus, depicting all the loops in the conflict in the current war in the Middle East. And his comment was, if we can only understand this diagram, we might be able to win the war. I mean, it was kind of a jokey thing. By the way, this lot will be available to you afterwards. You can have the slide set, okay? Um, and so it's, it's sort of, there's not a chance of, of being able to analyze that. We're, we're in a bit of a corner, and, and this is a, 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 a general statement. We have no gen, general mathematics that we can throw at nonlinear problems that will work. We can solve little narrow bits here and there, and we can get answers, but there is no general framework for solving nonlinear problems problems. And when I look at systems, I think of everything from computer systems through to politics, finance, weather prediction, genetics, proteomics, all of these things are very similar. And, and we don't know what is happening. And so here's a selection of things that we're struggling with, like earthquake prediction, like why is it that your heart sits on the edge of fibrillation all the time, and if it doesn't, you die? So life itself sits right at the edge of the interface with death. And if it doesn't, the system fails. So it's, all, it's almost like life itself is tuned to be right on the edge of catastrophe. And these are very interesting questions. So the finance system, there is not a banker. Uh, people get Nobel Prizes in economics for things that clearly don't work. It fascinates me. How the heck do you get a Nobel Prize for something that's useless. But that's what they do, and they call it a science. And economics is not a science. It's more like witchcraft, and it doesn't work. So these are the, the kind of problems we're struggling at. So this is the only game in town. As far as I can see, there's only one game in town. It's computer modeling combined with war gaming, combined with Monte Carlo sensitivity analysis. That's what we have to use. We, we go and play. Now, here's the big problem. We don't know where to go in this huge nonlinear space. And we don't have the, enough people and enough compa uh, computers to go blindly into this space and analyze every situation. So we need to do something else. So here's a statement from my early education. Um, there's nothing quite as powerful as a really good theory because it focuses our energies. And this comes from a time when I first was introduced to computers. I was in, at Nottingham uh, at university. The computer was in Manchester. We used to write our code, and it was on punch cards. They went in a box. They were taken by car up to Manchester. And a week later, you'd get your program back with a little note, and it said, didn't compile. Uh, and that was the state of computing at that time. Uh, a lot of my, my first degree was on slide rule and it was on log tables, and by the time I got into my master's degree, we got access to computers on, on site. When I got to my PhD, they were starting to get readily available. So what we tried to do was focus the computing power that we got smack into the hotspot of the problem area. Now, increasingly, we're having to do that today because as we get uh, more computing power and more knowledge, we keep finding more and more interesting problems, and, it, and there's what we thought was simple is actually quite complex. And so we're trying to understand this stuff. So 
Here's an engineering maxim. Engineers are brilliant. I am one. You know, they've got supreme arrogance. The mathematicians may declare that something's impossible. Just get out of the way, an engineer will fix it. We will find a pro we'll find a solution to an impossible problem. It may be the wrong solution, but we will give you a solution. And part of the attitude is, because we don't understand something, doesn't mean to say we can't use it. And if we can get some kind of knowledge, then the ethos of engineering is, we'll make you a better one. So the medieval archers uh, would be drawing on a string of around 80 to 90 pounds. Um, I can pull about 45, but I can't hold still. I get the shakes. And uh, they, they would fire an arrow uh, over 400 meters, which was why we won against the French. You know, the French hadn't got quite so just good bows. Um, now, uh, a modern bow will pull three, four times that. But what you feel, because of the leverage of the compounding of the, the mechanism, is something like 20 pounds. So you can be much more stable. And you do it with lighter materials. So, I've been working on a problem for a while. Sat at my desk, I get a call from a defense company. Mild state of panic. They got three artificial intelligence systems. And they needed to make a judgment call which one should we buy? Which one should we implement? So that was the base problem that got me into this. The snag was this system was dealing with thousands of fixed and mobile terminals that were people, weaponry, tanks, sensors, and there were hundreds of outputs. The combinatorial problem is so huge, you can't flood test it, you can't exhaustively test it, you, you just can't do a thing. So you've got no mechanism for actually comparing and saying, actually, system B is better than system A and C. So that was my brief. So here's the way I, I went about it. First of all, there are no books on the subject, there, there are no papers, no office shelf solutions. There's nothing out there. You're on your own and everybody's looking at you. It's like, oh, right, better start thinking. So I started from this point. Why is my laptop so dumb? Why isn't it really intelligent? Why doesn't it help me? And um, it, it has an abundance of processing power and memory and connectivity. Great. But it does such dumb things. I can type in day after day on email, Jane, and it will do anything other than give me my wife. So the one person that I email more than any other never comes up first. How dumb is that? And by the way, my machine is a, a Microsoft Free Zone. So you know, it's, this, is, this is an Apple machine, and it's, it's so dumb. But it, it gets worse. Um, and the reason I ask the question is, if you give me a laptop or any computer that's 10 or 100 times more powerful than the one I have, I can't think any faster, deeper, work any harder, or sit at that keyboard any longer than I do now. I've plateaued. So after decades of my work output per unit time going up exponentially with the technology, I've actually hit the limit. I can't do any more. I need some help. You need some help. We all need some help. And I'll give you a good example. Um, go on to Google and search any topic. Google is both brilliant and useless at the same time. Uh, so I go in and I type in artificial intelligence. And there are 38,700,000 references out there and it gets them in point one four of a millisecond. Absolutely brilliant. Here's the first 10. What do I do now? What about all the others? What I would like it to do is monitor what I'm working on, monitor who I am talking to, monitor where my thought pattern is going, and I would like it to go out and find the stuff relevant to what I am doing. That would be the way for a search engine to work. The next thing I want it to do is to check the veracity of the information it puts in front of me. Something like 90% of all the stuff on the internet is worthless because it's wrong. 
but we just keep pumping this stuff out. So here's a polarization of opinion. Philosophers, to the present day, machines will never be intelligent like us. I don't find this a terribly effective or interesting point of view. It doesn't help a lot. Another point of view, the singularity priesthood. Do you guys follow Ray Kurzweil and the singularity folks? They are convinced that by 2035 the machines are going to wipe us out because the progress of the machines is exponential. Uh, intelligence is therefore growing exponentially. Ergo, we stand no chance. They're wrong, not in a small way, but I'm going to show you that they are wrong in a really big way. And then there's this third point of view. Jesus Christ, no wonder these human beings can't do very much. They've got this soggy piece of meatware. They can't do mental arithmetic, and they can't remember anything accurately. So any criticism you level at, com at robots and computers, I think that the robots and computers could equally well level a criticism back at us at our crudity. After all, it's taken us... Uh, something in excess of three billion years to get here and we're still not all that good so in some respects so I, I don't find any of this really useful so I don't care for the opinions and uh, I only care really about the actuality and the exploitation of the stuff now let's get on with it and so um, I think of uh, things like this you know if uh, if I've got a screw to put in, I could use my finger now, but it sure is going to hurt. So I use a screwdriver because it amplifies my muscle. Um, I think of my laptop or any computer as something that amplifies my brain power. Uh, and I think of networks as something that can amplify my intellect. And so I'm now looking for some kind of symbiosis with machines that allows me to amplify my knowledge and my wisdom. That's where I want to go. I want to make, I want to understand more, but I want to make better and wiser decisions, and I want to do it faster. Uh, and that's what I'm looking for. So here's the $64,000 question. Are machines capable of thinking, creativity, independent problem solving? Will they become truly intelligent? So I'm going to run you uh, a little movie here. Do you know the question nobody asked? How the heck did Deep Blue win? They were all upset because Deep Blue had wiped out the human race and now there's not a lot of point in playing chess because you know, a cheap computer will just wipe you out without a thought. But everybody was upset about the fact that something had been turned upside down because right through my child childhood I'd heard this computers will never think, computers will never play a game, computers will never play chess, computers will never play chess and beat a human being, computers never beat a grandmaster and all of a sudden the world champions wiped out and, and so people got upset and I thought well, I was very irrational and said well it's just a bunch of algorithms, yep and so are we so Here's a, a, a way of sort of thinking about it. Um, everything that uh, you are wearing, everything that you consume, everything that you use, every facility that you enjoy is provided by machines with a degree of intelligence. And um, they're able to manufacture things uh, that we can't uh, conceive of. And uh, some of it is kind of stunning. So this is uh, a planetary walker that came out of the mind of a machine and not out of the mind of a man or a woman. It's now being built by NASA. So people are now taking in designs by, human, by machines and uh, adopting them uh, and, and trying to make them a reality. So uh, another way of looking at it is if, you, if you've got a, a mobile phone, chances are the chips in your mobile phone have been designed by a machine and not a human being because human beings can't do it anymore. I used to be a chip designer years ago, and um, I stopped being a chip designer when I saw the first 
genetic algorithms produce better designs than we could. And I thought, time for a new job, go do something else. And it's kind of a shock, but that is happening all over. Here's a, a bunch of inventions, and this, by the way, uh, goes back 10 years. Uh, 10 years ago, computers had reinvented all of this stuff. The human beings had invented uh, decades before. Kind of stunning. When I look at electronic circuits, and I used to be a circuit designer, um, the computer designed circuits we do not understand how they work because they utilize all of the th components that we used to clamp down in order to keep the circuit simple and well behaved and linear. And the computers utilize all the spurious bits and pieces to make a better circuit and a better circuit performance, which is also interesting. So things like this uh, tend to be uh, designed hand in hand uh, with, with a human being. The really complicated stuff, the machines do it. So how many people have seen Jeopardy and IBM Watson? Yeah, pretty cool, isn't it? So let's set the scene. Um, there are three contestants on the right hand side. This is a game show. It's America, so they've got to admit, win a lot of money. Okay, so, <coughs> and, and so they ask, ask questions, general knowledge questions, press the button, answer the question. Uh, the two guys uh, are the champions. The guy on the far side is just unbelievable uh, in his ability to recall information. But smack in the middle uh, is IBM Watson, a mere computer. Just watch this. It's kind of fun. We're getting here. What do you say we play Jeopardy? Let's get right into the Jeopardy round. These categories, a man, a plane, a canal, eerie, chicks dig me, children's book titles, my Michelle, MC5, and finally, vocabulary. Ken, you're in the first position. Please make a selection. Uh, I've never said this on TV. Chicks dig me for 200, please. <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson. What is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson? Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Same category, 600. At the Olduvai Gorge in 1959, she and Hubby Lewis found a 1.75 million year old Australopithecus Boise-eyed skull. Watson? Who is Mary Leakin? You're right. 800, same category. Harriet Boyd Hawes was the first woman to discover and excavate a Minoan settlement on this island. Watson, what is Crete? Well, it just goes on like that. The human beings don't answer a single question. And when you lift the lid on Watson, it's quite staggering. There's uh, over 250 algorithms uh, associated with uh, finding the information. And then it, it does um, a little probability test to see how good the answer is. And it starts off by uh, putting its hand up or pressing the button when the answer is 95% likely. But as it wins more money, it starts to gamble and it reduces that probability down to 70% and it gets faster. And it, it, because now it's got money in the bank, it can afford to lose it. It's an absolute hoot. So uh, the game's over. The, the machines are better than we are. So here's, um, here's a, a couple of medics, but uh, quite a telling uh, uh, story. 20% of medical errors are diagnostic errors. And it's not that they're missed diagnoses, often they're delayed. Watson has the capacity to get the diagnosis up there sooner. Suppose you're a clinician, a doctor, a nurse trying to diagnose a very complex case. You have some ideas, but in order to confirm your hypothesis, confirm what you think is wrong, you need a lot of information. For at least 30 years, it's been humanly impossible for a physician to master all the material they need to practice at the highest level. That statement prompted me to do something. I went out and figured out what the half-life of information was for the medics. And the answer is less than three and a half years. So these guys do a seven-year degree course. Halfway through the course, the material that they just learned is a waste of time. Whoops. I was just kind of a, and then I had a look at other people. Physicists are not too bad. They, their information lasts about 13 and a half years. But everybody's now suffering with 
information that, and things they learn evaporating real quick. So this, this poses some interesting uh, legal issues. So uh, I've got Patrick Dixon now, he's a, an English doctor, and uh, he's got a very interesting statement for you. Just watch this. You know, already for some specialty areas in medicine, doctors like me are regularly overruled by computers. In intensive care, if you were taken or a member of your family into an intensive care unit, let's say with severe burns, so much so that you only have a 20% chance of survival. You know something? The computer algorithms that have been developed are so powerful that they... Oops, sorry, my finger. Let me just take it back. You know, already for some specialty areas in medicine, doctors like me are regularly overruled by computers. In intensive care, if you were taken or a member of your family into an intensive care unit, let's say with severe burns, so much so that you only have a 20% chance of surviving. You know something? The computer algorithms that have been developed are so powerful that they are more effective, more accurate, more of the time than any physician is likely to be. Which means that if I come to my own therapeutic decision, and it's a different decision than the computer, and I follow it, and my patient unfortunately dies, you know what? I will be up before the judges, I will be sued in the court of law. So uh, there's some interesting challenges heading our way. So um, what is kind of interesting as uh, time progresses, um, I, I uh, as a young man, I got kind of interested by uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick when they made the movie 2001, and then all the young people don't know what 2001 is, and then I find young people, students now, don't know what Star Wars is, and uh, you know, but they, have, but they have seen, uh, they have seen some of the uh, stuff uh, on movies. Um, Star Trek seems to go on forever, and uh, and so we have this very interesting thing where artificial intelligence. Uh, is either shown as benign, loving of the human race, helping us, and then for the most part, it's malevolent and it's out to kill us. So, right, how did that happen? Well, we have Asimov's laws of robotics, and uh, they say that robots shouldn't hurt people. So what does the human race do? They stick guns on a flying robot and instruct it to go out and kill people. That's not the technology fault, that's not the robot's fault, that's people fault. So it's kind of stunning uh, the way this stuff goes along, but this is uh, 2001. Any, anybody not seen 2001? You haven't seen 2001? That's cool. Well, I'll just run you the thing. Yeah, okay, well, uh, this, uh, this computer uh, has got itself into a bit of a fix. Um, uh, this is a, a deep space mission. Uh, they've just done uh, an expedition outside uh, the spacecraft, and um, it, it's already uh, managed to uh, kill one or two people. And this guy is outside, and, and this uh, th this line when I first had it, heard it just sent shudder down my spine. It's really cool. Watch this. Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Al. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Al? Although you took very thorough precautions in the pod against my feet, I could see your lips move. Uh, and so it goes on. It's like, oh no! Yeah, sort of. So, um, so here we are. Uh, the computers are bringing new levels of creativity. They uh, allows us to solve more problems, but there's sort of uh, underlying threat scenarios in the background. Uh, and people say, aren't they just a bunch of talking machines and they're running algorithms? Yep, and uh, actually that's what we are too. 
We just happen to be wetware instead of uh, hardware, and um, it's just a different paradigm. So the big problem is we can't have a conversation about intelligence because there's no definition. You go to the philosophers, there's over 150 published definitions of intelligence that range from things like the ability to hold a conscious thought, the ability to solve a problem, and, and none of these things help you. Uh, in fact, they're useless. Alfred Binet came up with his IQ test for the reasons stated there, because a bunch of philosophers decided that the human race had an intelligence that was set at birth, and that was it, you were stuffed. And then uh, he came up with the IQ test, which he declared very dangerous and shouldn't be used and has now been widely adopted by industry and education and actually it doesn't work, but it's used as a standard, which is kind of humorous. And then there's Alan Turing's test, which is very simple. You, you talk to a human being, you talk to a computer, and if you can't tell the difference between them, hey, it's an intelligent machine. Um, and that's interesting, but it's not u useful. So. I go along and I, I look at these guys and I say, well, how the heck do they get their predictions? And what they do is they take the processing power we have in our hand and the memory that we have in our hand and say, these two quantities are indicative of intelligence and because they're growing exponentially, obviously intelligence is growing exponentially. And then they produce graphs like this and they say, wow, uh, the internet is already more intelligent than a human being. Uh, I say, phooey. <laughs> it's it, it certainly got more neurons than a single human being. It's got more neurons than about a hundred human beings. It's got more memory capacity than a human being. It's got more processing power. But it doesn't have the intelligence of a spider. It, it's still very dumb. And so I ask the question, why the heck is that? And so and how do we compare systems? So, so that, that was my problem. So I started to play. And first thing I sort of thought of was I can think of a shed load of systems that have no processing power and no memory. And here's one of them. A jellyfish has no processing and no memory. It is a bunch of single cells that come together to create an animal. And if you chop it in half, it becomes two. And another one that, that is even more dramatic is slime mold. Slime mold comes together as a gob of fluid that glumps over the forest floor, finds something to consume, it breaks up, consumes whatever the food is, then comes back together and goes off hunting again. There is no processing and no memory. Let me put a proviso in. There is a sensor and an actuator, and there is a delay between the two. So strictly speaking, there is a bit of memory, because delay equates to memory, okay? So as an engineer, I said, that doesn't count. It's not real memory. And the processing power is click, click. It's literally one and not. Okay, so I'm saying that's not processing power, not memory. And, and that's uh, my choice. So here's a, a terrifying experiment that was first conducted in Belgium, is now being conducted in the UK and in the United States. You take comatose patients people who are declared brain dead, and they've been brain dead for 10 years, you stick them in an MRI scanner, and you whisper in their ear, I want you to think about playing tennis. And uh, the output varies. In the first tests in Belgium, over 60% of the people lit up in the same way that you and I would light up. And um, in the UK and the US, it's, uh, it's got down to um, about 20%. So here we are with somewhere between 20 and 60 percent of the comatose p patients in the world who are actually trapped. They can't communicate. So these people are entombed in meat space. And you think about this and you say, well, they've got receptors. They can obviously hear. They can probably feel. They may not be able to smell. They may be able to taste. They might even be able to see but they've got no output mechanism, and because they've got no output mechanism, we declare them dead, brain dead. They're not intelligent, they're just a cabbage with a clock that's keeping all their bodily functions going. So this is another sort of challenge. So I came up with uh, these two conditions. Um, if you have no sensor, or no actuator, no input mechanism, or no output mechanism, or both no input and output, no intelligence. So 
You can have intelligence without memory and processing power, but without an input and output mechanism, no intelligence. Okay, so there, there's a, a few conditions that the priesthood had not sort of come up with. So I then came up with this axiomatic uh, statement uh, that seemed to be blindingly obvious to me. Intelligence has to be entropic. This is about change of state of information. It's about rearranging the chemicals and the electrons in my brain or your brain or taking in information and doing something physical. Any state of change, and if you don't know about entropy, uh, there's a fun read, uh, uh, the, the guy's name is uh, Boltzmann, uh, the epitaph on his uh, gravestone is great, it's uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, um, S equals K log W, and that, uh, S equals K log W is the formula for entropy. He told the world about entropy. Nobody believed him, so he killed himself. And, uh, and so um, uh, let me give you some examples uh, of entropy. Um, if I put a cup of hot coffee there and walk away and come back in an hour, you would expect it to be cold. If I put a glass of water here and come back in an hour, you don't expect it boiling. So things naturally go down to the lowest level. Always. Energy always goes down to the lowest level. And so you find this comes up nicely. If you, if you know about Shannon's uh, information theory, it's exactly the same thing. Order, disorder. Piece of paper with lots of printing on it is very high entropy. Sort of disorder. If you were to wash it and break up the ink, it would become low entropy. All the ink is spread out across the page evenly. Okay, so that's what is happening. And what's happening in here is we're gathering stuff together and creating order. So some people object to this. So here's a fun definition. My, my wife hates this. Um, but, but you might appreciate it. It's a 30 second tutorial on entropy. And um, it took me a while to come up with this. But um, so engineers and scientists and mathematicians get it. Um, other people uh, don't, but I can't resist doing it. Um, so here we are, entropy in 30 seconds. There is a game. We're all in the game. You can't get out of the game. There's no opting out. Everybody is in the game. The bad news is you can't win. The good news is you can break even, but you can only break even on a cold day. There's a snag. It never gets that cold. Okay, so that's, that's potted 30 second intro to entropy. It's worth reading up on. It governs the universe and it's the mechanism that is going to kill you. Your death is assured by the celestial ratchet of entropy. Entropy gets us all. It will kill the universe and everything in it, literally. So I started by doing a bit of a Don Dr. Johnston and said, uh, I'm going to de declare a definition of, of uh, in intelligence, and I don't care what anybody thinks, and I'm going to use this as a basis. And so I defined uh, entropy beyond all this stuff, which didn't help me, and I, I took into account things like this. So if you see um, leaves on the floor, and it's a random scatter, you know, it's a, a low entropy situation, it's conceivable the, the, the leaves on the step there were blown on by the wind and some order was put in or somebody did it with a, a blower. It could be either solution or with a sweeping brush. It could be, it could be that a pile of leaves would be created by some whirlwind or something but it seems a bit unlikely and certainly two piles are unlikely and, um, and definitely uh, a wheelbarrow full of leaves uh, isn't created by some random action. This in, invokes some intelligence. It, it, it requires intelligence to come up with that kind of a picture. So um, the intelligence definition is the difference in the entropy at the input and the output. And so uh, uh, have you guys read this book? You, you know about Douglas Hanavamson, 42. What's surprising is that most people have not worked out that's a free running clock in a computer. It's just one note, one note, one note. And, uh, and so uh, I, I knew Douglas quite well. Uh, it was a hoot. Um, 
but um, it, it's not a very useful uh, answer. So um, here we go. This is a formula, and it just says the intelligence of something is the modulus of the difference of the entropy in and out of the system. So I'm not going to bore you with a shed load of maths. Um, if somebody wants to go over this afterwards, I'll gladly, gladly show you, but I'll, I'll show you some of the things. So I defined a system like this, uh, and then I said, well, you know, it could have lots of other loops in it, and it could be also layered. So uh, you don't put um, all the brains in the head of the dog. Uh, the reason why uh, you don't lose a finger when you trap it in a drawer or put it in a flame is that the message to move it doesn't go to your brain and back. You've got a local nerve center that makes you move. And if you didn't, you'd, you'd lose a finger. So we distribute um, the processing uh, for, for all org organisms. And so uh, this distance is important. Eye to brain distance is important. Um, the pre-processing in the eye is important. The brain couldn't cope with the full visual impact. And there's a lot of pre-processing in there. So you get a very complicated diagram, and it's way beyond our ability to analyze. So I picked something simple, and this is one of the systems I picked, and I started to analyze it. And what I came up with was mathematics that looked like this. And I'm going to tell you the tricky punchline in a moment. And then uh, we get the entropic expression like this. And that starts to look promising. And uh, by combining parts, great. Now I have to put my hand up and admit something. The complex functions for processing and memory and sensor and actuator cannot be defined. We cannot write down an equation for what happens in the memory, what happens with all the processing, and what happens in the sensor and the actuator. So a mathematical trick is to say, I'm not interested in the detail, I'm interested in the magnitude. So I will assign a fixed number to each of these quantities and it will give me a ballpark. And you'll see a ballpark figure. And you'll see the reason why in a moment. So these complex operators, we cannot define. They're functions of time. We can't define them. So you say, OK, I'll give them a number. This upsets the mathematicians a lot. And um, with a bit of mathematical juggling, you find that here's the intelligence, the comparative intelligence of a system, where there are a couple of constants k in there. But it says the actuator, the sensor, is in there, and the processing power and the memory. So just look at that equation for a moment. If I put the processor to zero, or the memory to zero, or both, I've still got intelligence. But if either the sensor or the actuator goes to zero, then the intelligence goes to zero. So on that test, it works. It seems to satisfy the uh, conditions we set when we started. And by the way, it looks awfully like Boltzmann's equation, S equals K log W, hurrah. Right? Not by some accident, uh, definitely by design. So I, kept, I played for a little bit longer and um, did all kinds of things and then I slipped in there the floating uh, operating uh, floating operations per second in the bottom to give it a measure of efficacy. Uh, and this is about um, some people are ultra intelligent, but it takes them longer to solve a problem than somebody who is less intelligent. And you've all sat outside of somebody like that in class. There's always some kid in your class who can remember everything and you can't, but then you find you have some attribute that he doesn't. So you're now into deciding what attributes of the system are the ones that you require. And in uh, warfare, for exa exa example, you may be more interested in uh, being able to take out seven threats um, in 20 seconds opposed to all of the threats in five minutes, by which time you'll be dead. Okay, so it's that kind of trade-off, and that's what you're doing. So this was the equation that was applied in the defense industry, and here are the key implications. 
we're not racing towards a singularity as fast as people project it. And the reason is, if you put an exponential function in for the processing power and the memory and the sensors and the actuators, because of that logarithmic function, it comes out linear. So it's not an exponential race into the future. It turns out to be more like a, a linear race into the future. And so it, it's, it looks something like that which is a lot less of uh, a threat. So this is the, uh, the priesthood of the singularity, uh, and I think that it's, it's much, much slower. So I think we can rest easy. 2035 is not the demise of the human race. Um, it may well be another thousand years or so, because there's a heck of a lot of difference between a linear growth and an exponential growth. So I'm not losing any sleep at night, but I am fretting that my machine is still not... Uh, smart enough. And there's some really good news, and the really good news is we're rolling out mobile devices by their billions. Last year, over 800 million smartphones were manufactured and delivered to customers. In the coming year, it's likely we're going to exceed a billion. We have never, as a species, been able to manufacture anything to that scale and deploy it at that rate ever before. My mobile phone knows a lot. Uh, it's switched off at the moment, but if it was switched on, it would know that I'm walking. It would know where I am. But best of all, it knows where I've been, and it knows where I'm going to in a minute. It knows who emails me, who texts me, who I talk to, who rings me, who, uh, and so on. And so you think, well, here we've got a vast machine gathering information. Uh, should it become adaptable? Uh, should it become a little bit intelligent? Uh, I think so. I think it's going to get intelligent. And so uh, I have a unit for you. The, the, the simplest component that I can think of that is intelligent is a thermostat. It senses a temperature change and goes click. And so what happened with this is I did this for the defense industry. I did it for a world of electronics, and I said so. And the next thing, a bunch of biologists come steaming in from University of California, San Diego, and they've been <laughs> applying it to all kinds of biological things. And I've got very excited because they've decided that a single cell is intelligent. And I would agree with them. And it's been a big debate in the circles of the biologists whether a single cell is intelligent or not. And I think it's highly intelligent. So. Uh, after this evening, you may not look at another blade of grass and think of it as quite so dumb. The really good news is IBM and Google are moving into this space. I think we're assured of things happening. The other good news is Watson and other intelligences are going to come to your mobile phone and your pad and your laptop by the cloud very shortly. If you go on to Cochrane.org.uk, that presentation and an awful lot more are on there. You can download. Um, when I was a student, I'm looking at the students right now, uh, my, my professor said to me uh, one time, Mr. Cochrane, if you go out there and steal one man's results, that's plagiarism. But if you steal 10 men's results, that's research. So go do some research. Thank you.